Because of science, people are living much longer, but they have greater needs in terms of their decision making. So now is the time to start to think about what I want for my future self when my future self can't make those decisions. Hello and welcome to another episode of the HSE Talking Health and Wellbeing podcast. My name is Fergal Fox and today we're speaking with Creva Gleeson, who's the General Manager in Human Rights and Equality Policy in the HSE, and Susie Byrne, who's a disability activist, but also works as a regional manager for the National Advocacy Service in the Greater Dublin area. You're very welcome to the podcast. Thanks very much, Virgil. So today we're talking about planning ahead for your health care. Now, sometimes in this podcast, we have strong health and well-being content, but we're covering this area because it links very strongly to people's health and well-being in terms of their thinking. And I know you use the term advanced healthcare directive is what we're going to be talking. We'll we'll break that down in a minute. It's really about planning ahead for your healthcare, isn't it? Yeah. So it's about planning ahead for the time that you can't make decisions for yourself. That's what we really want to talk about. If you're able to make your own decisions, you, you go ahead and do that. But there are legal provisions in Ireland now that have been introduced recently where you can plan ahead for a time when you can't make your own decisions. And not being able to make decisions the term that you're using here is around capacity to make a decision. What do you see as, as somebody having the capacity to make a decision? How would you describe that? In this circumstance, it's about when you're not able to tell yeah. somebody. And so you might be unconscious, not able to communicate your wishes. And maybe there hasn't been somebody who knows what your wishes are. You haven't had a chance to have that conversation with somebody or nobody knows. And it could be an emergency situation. Nobody knows what you want. And people may want to know what would you have liked to have happened or happen next, whether, you know, a form of treatment or a form of intervention. And what we're saying now, I suppose, is that there's this great opportunity for everybody to put their wishes on paper in a variety of different formats, which we'll talk about. And also to have conversations with people close to you to let them know what you want and that you have wishes should certain things happen, should you become extremely ill and not able to tell somebody and a doctor or a healthcare provider not able to have a conversation with you, that they'll know because you have a statement of wishes or a healthcare directive or somebody that you've appointed who would be acting on your instruction because you would have told them beforehand what you want to happen in certain situations. And you give some examples there that if somebody can have an accident and their decision making capacity is just changed fundamentally like in a second. But there's other cases and scenarios where that may evolve or change over time as we get older. And I know that you made the point to me, Creve, about we have an increase in population that are going to have dementia and are going to be maybe losing that capacity and living longer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's about 65,000 people in Ireland have dementia now, and that's that's forecast to double by 2040. But there's also other conditions that have increased exponentially. The numbers of people having acquired brain injury, road traffic accidents have increased. And you can see the figures this year, they've increased again. That can result in brain injury. But there's other conditions as well. Because of science, people are living much longer, but they have greater needs in terms of their decision making. So now is the time to start to think about what I want for my future self when my future self can't make those decisions. I saw the term have been used, and my colleague was just using it with me earlier on today, about a living will. I think that's a good term to get into people's head that may not have heard of this, about planning ahead. You know, people would be familiar with a will uh, for your money or your possessions or your family. But this is a plan for when you're going to be alive, but you don't have that ability to make decisions. And the great thing about it now is that I think people will have heard of living wills before, but they weren't legal. Right. And this is now the great positive change that has been made is that the Assisted Decision Making Act commenced in 2023 and advanced healthcare directives and the right for people, their will and preference to be heard. And this is really what is pivotal in this is about everybody's wishes being known and being acted on and respected if they're set out in the appropriate way and if people know what they are and that they will be respected. Because a living will before people would have made them, might have told people or might have written them down. They didn't have a legal standing. Now they do. So the assisted decision making has been a game changer and it's been a big impetus into the advancement of this work. And this is going to become more and more normal that we're definitely going to see it right across healthcare, right across our personal lives. It's going to impact on everybody. We need to be thinking this way. Yes and no. I think maybe just to start by saying that in Ireland, we're very, very poor at having conversations about our future. 
about our living future, but about death as well. The numbers of people that make a will in Ireland is 30%, which is very low compared to our other jurisdictions. And then when you kind of drill down into that, the numbers of people who know about what an advanced healthcare directive is, and I know we're going to talk a bit more about that, it's in and around about 24%, but the numbers who actually go and make one is about 4%. The numbers that make a thing called an enduring power of attorney is about 6%. And these are things that you make when you have capacity for your future self. So there's a job to be done to encourage people to have conversations with their family, with their friends, with whoever's closest to them yeah. about their future. Now, you know, I think I think that's really important. So as well as looking ahead for yourself personally, you see Irish societies on a journey with this awareness that we're only kind of coming to the table on this now. The Assistant Decision Making Act has been an enabler, but we still have to raise awareness about this very significantly. Yeah, a turning point was in 2020 with the pandemic. Right. So we saw like really serious information coming from Italy, from China, from other parts of the world where... Scary information. Scary information that said you could end up on a ventilator. That was a turning point in terms of people having conversations, very difficult conversations with family about, well, what happens when you go on a ventilator? What happens if you don't recover from that ventilator? What do you want? Unfortunately, like we haven't continued that. So I suppose part of the awareness raising now is that we need to continue to have those conversations because, you know, something could happen to you within the next 10 minutes. You could have a stroke. Yeah. You know, you could get knocked down by a bus. You know, there's, there's all kinds of things that can happen. And then the person that's left behind, if you haven't made it clear what you want, that often falls on a friend or family who doesn't necessarily know what it was you wanted. How did you feel about artificial nutrition and hydration? How did you feel about being kept alive longer than maybe you wanted to? Those are really important conversations to have when you can now. And again, I go back to COVID because people had those conversations. Difficult, but because there was a vista coming at them, they were yeah. able to have it. So we can do it. I think we just need to we need to start doing it more. All our work is about prevention. If we can make these wishes known to our loved ones, we make these healthcare directives ahead of time. You're really cutting off loads of uncertainty. Like you're, you're just giving the example there, Quiva, about not getting your wishes respected, but you didn't pass on your wishes in some sort of formal or informal way. So nobody can nobody can do about them. But the impact if you do nothing, it can cause a lot of difficulty in your family and in your healthcare provision. You know, who's making the decision if you don't make the decision? Isn't that it? It's definitely, I think it places an onus maybe on friends and family who to make decisions or to be asked or to think about things. And if you haven't talked to them beforehand about it or you haven't put your wishes formally in some way, and it's a time of crisis often that this has been talked about. So people don't know what to do or what to say, you know, and I know that we respect that healthcare providers will do whatever they have to do, you know, and what they think it best. But they often would rather know what people's wishes are and have those communicated to them. And one of the reasons I think we were talking about people living longer, but also people are more likely to be maybe single and living alone in society now as people live longer. And amongst your group as a disabled woman, there's a lot of people with disabilities who are living independently and maybe, you know, making decisions for themselves and getting on with their lives. And a lot of us are talking to each other. And, and even before COVID, we were talking about these situations, about what would happen if we became ill and would our wishes be respected? And one of the things that I experienced a time in intensive care 10 years ago where I was going in for emergency surgery, I made my wishes known as to who the person who should be spoken to if I'm not able to should be. And unfortunately, at the time, that didn't happen. They weren't able to access information about me and they weren't consulted. Right. And indeed, it was a family member instead who was. I'm OK with that, but that wasn't what my I wish know, was, know. you know, initially. What well, that meant for me and it demonstrated to me that it was really important that when we have these arrangements in place now that I can make my wishes known and that I can tell my healthcare providers, but also tell the people who I want to ensure my wishes are followed, that that's all in place. It was really distressing at the time. I wasn't aware of what was going on yeah. because I was ill. But for my partner at the time, it's extremely, really, yeah. really especially upsetting. If, especially if you've passed on. They weren't able to, you know, find out where I was. They weren't. They were told that they couldn't receive information about me. And then they didn't know what treatment I was being offered at that time. And it was really difficult, you know, for, for it was a short period of time, but it was a very worrying period of time. 
what I and other people with disabilities have been thinking about is the fact that we need to be respected. Anybody in society, no matter whether you have a disability or not, should be respected as a decision maker, as somebody who has thoughts, feelings, wishes yeah. that they need to be respected. Absolutely. And when it comes to your health care and those circumstances of when you're not able to communicate what you want to happen, that, you know, people will ask well, do you have those wishes set out? Can I see them? And then your care can be planned accordingly. And that's what this is about. And I think what I wanted and what I say to people now in my work is about making sure that your wishes for everything are communicated to those who need to know. Because even in work, I still get phone calls from people I worked with 10 years ago, from people close to them, ringing me saying, did you ever talk to Jamie about X, you know, about what they wanted to do if they were, you know, they're now unconscious or even after they've passed on, what do they want to happen in terms of their funeral? You know, so it's all of those things where those conversations didn't happen at the time. And then people are scrambling at time of high emotional distress to find out what happened. You know, I think that's a key point, isn't it? That if you leave it to that place where your emotions are in turmoil and you're upset or, you know, anybody close to the person that you know, something has happened to, or even if it's been a, a gradual thing, you're still a family member, you're upset. There's loss there at some level that you may be grieving that person's capacity that they've lost. So it's very, very sensitive. And it's nearly, it's a bit dangerous to leave it to that time. It's unlikely that everybody's going to be thinking with a cool head and you're not planning ahead essentially at all. You've lost that opportunity to plan ahead, haven't you? Mm. To give you an example, so say you have a big family yeah. and no one has talked to mum. To find out what does mum want? What did mum want if she had a very significant stroke, which the chance of recovery are very limited, but the seven or eight people in the family and they're all pulling in different directions. That's like it's distressing for mum who's at the centre of this. It's really distressing for the siblings who are all pulling in all kinds of directions. But ultimately, it's really distressing for the healthcare professional who's trying to make a decision, but has all of this conflicting information. Even if you can do something really basic as have a conversation, if something happened, whatever it is, and and again, it all depends on the scenario. If something happened, what would you want? The three of us could ask each other right now what would happen. And for someone like me, I find it quite difficult to plan ahead of that. But I have faith in doctors and nurses and healthcare professions. So my wishes are that they make the best possible decision at that time. I've had surgery on my own. I haven't had anybody else with me because I didn't want them with me. And I probably would be like that in the future. I trust science, but not everyone is like that. I have a sister who's the complete opposite to me and she doesn't want any intervention. You know, she's had like non-interventionist childbirth. It's so particular to the person. And if you have lots of people in a family or lots of friends, it's their issues that are coming, not the person's. That's what's really important here to get to the core of what is it that you would like. People that have very strong religious faith will say, well, I believe in God. I put my faith in God. But if you haven't had the conversation, you're just making it up. And I think that's what we really want to get to, that you hear what the person wanted or what they would have wanted in this situation. What can I do to plan ahead then? You know, like you mentioned conversations between family members. Is that a good place to start with this? With family members or with friends, you know, to have that conversation, say, look, I'm thinking about getting my affairs in order and I want people to know what I want to happen in certain situations. The great thing about the tools that are available to people in this is that they're free. Yeah. Okay. You don't need a solicitor in order to put them uh, together. So you can do a simple non-legally binding statement of wishes about what you want. Or you can go and you can make an advanced healthcare directive and you can discuss with your family and friends about that with your GP, I would think is probably important. And then also with, you know, if you are having treatment or going to hospital, making sure that they're aware of it and bringing it with you should you be admitted, you know, into hospital, but also just having people aware that you have this directive in place. But it's really important that you let somebody know about it. You can move a bit further and have a representative appointed to carry out those wishes, but you don't have to nominate Mm -hmm. somebody. Some people just want to make the statement, have that available, have people have access to it rather than give somebody the responsibility of it. Other people would like to say, I want my brother, my father, my son or daughter or my friend to be my representative and that they will do what I want. And the thing about it is that you can decide to put into this and it's probably better that you make it clear rather than something that's vague. So you can say that 
you want intervening treatment in terms of like, resuscitation, yeah. okay. ventilation, artificial nutrition and hydration. Some people don't want to have that to be kept artificially alive, you know, yeah. so other people say yes, do. You know, if there's a chance of me having some quality of life, well, then I would like intervention. If there's no chance, then I would rather not have the intervention. You mentioned the format that wasn't advanced care directive, a statement of wishes. That's just your intention. It's sort of guidance, I yeah. suppose, and that healthcare providers would have. You can print off a template off the internet. You have this conversation, you're saying, have it with your close family, have it with your GP. You can put that down on paper and you can bring it into a healthcare setting. They have to take it into consideration. But the advanced healthcare directive is a legally binding piece. Yes. So what's the process of completing one of those? Say it's somebody who has been given a diagnosis, a cancer diagnosis. And so many people that will be listening to this will know someone with cancer or maybe has had cancer themselves. And probably those who have had a condition will understand this probably a bit better because they've been in a situation and they're facing it. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. So say someone has been through like very difficult treatment already and knows the trajectory of, you know, chemo, radiation, everything in between that comes with that. So it's come back and they've got a new diagnosis and it's not good. It's not looking good. So that might focus their mind in terms of what they don't want when things become untreatable or when things are looking grim. You know, so they might specify, you know, they know this didn't work the last time and it's the same cancer that's come back, for example. So in that situation, they're with a specialist team. So they'd sit down and talk with the specialist team about what they might put in their directive. They don't have to. It's good practice to sit down and talk with your practitioners because they they know, you know, like they see this. So it could be that they set out this when my condition comes to this point, I don't want certain kinds of pain medication. The last time that just made me terrible. I, you know, mm-hmm. I, I lost control about it and I didn't like that. Or I don't want, you know, some people might say I don't want chemo. If it comes to a point that I now lack capacity, I don't want chemo. And they, they've said that in advance. Your directive can be really specific. I don't want artificial nutrition and hydration. I don't want to be resuscitated if my chance of survival is so poor and my quality of life will be so poor having had all of this treatment. So that's for someone who has a treatment, a diagnosis. For someone that doesn't have anything, like say right now, you know, it could be that if I'm in a road traffic accident, I have very significant injury and there is no chance of me coming out of this. I don't want to have artificial nutrition and hydration. I don't want to be in a permanent vegetative state. And that might be all you put in because that might be all you'll know now. Yeah. Saying things like I don't want any treatment in any context ever won't be valid because it's too general. Right. It's interesting that you, you know, you're given the example about cancer there and your treatment and things looking grim. But I suppose when you get to that stage, your healthcare professionals and your allies and the people that you're listening to or reading about, you're you're learning all about the journey that other people have gone on. I think palliative care has been so developed now yeah, yeah. that those conversations are much easier yeah. in those regards where people can be approached by healthcare providers to have those conversations and the supports are in place for that. They're a lot more advanced in putting people's wishes to, together and talking to people about it if they want to, because it's also a thing and we have to respect. And that's the great thing, I think, about the Assisted Decision Making Act. People can decide not to as well, you know, that they don't want to have those conversations and they want to leave it with doctors to decide what to do. But what we're trying to encourage to let other people know so that people can make those decisions and carry out and respect your wishes. The other thing I suppose just to mention is that there are other decisions that you can make and other things you can do outside of healthcare that enduring powers of attorney, which we won't be going into today. But, you know, those sort of things are also important to consider for people and also, you know, to appoint somebody as a healthcare decision maker that that possibility is there. Again, that's something that you don't need a solicitor to do either. Okay. So going back to the process of the advanced healthcare directive in terms of like, if I want to do this now, what's your recommendation to me practically? How is what I want to know now? Tell me how. There's a number of organizations that have done a lot of work on this over a number of years. So the first one is the Irish Hospice Foundation. They have a form called Think Ahead. And now Think Ahead covers a whole load of things. It talks about an advanced healthcare directive. It looks at making a will what your future wishes are for your funeral, what do you want to have done with your finances. So it goes every single kind of aspect of your life. What do you want in terms of your digital memory? You know, so it's really, it's a brilliant, yeah, it's a brilliant, brilliant piece of work. Where are all the passwords? All your passwords, you know, your Facebook profile, all of that. So they've done superb work. What I would say is go to 
Think Ahead, just even if you Google thinkahead.ie, it'll bring it to the form and then you'll see all of the stuff. And even if you just started to look at that first to get familiar with that and to start to think about your future self, you may eventually come to the Advanced Healthcare Directive piece, but I think that would be my go to. There's another organisation called Safeguarding Ireland who have just done a campaign on advanced healthcare directives. And again, if you Google safeguarding Ireland dot it's dot org, I'm just looking dot, at dot it. org. Yeah. So there's information there that's specifically on advanced healthcare directives. There's a little clip that was an ad on the media radio. That's helpful just to listen to, but I think that's a good place. One other organization then is an organization called the Decision Support Service. They have a form as well that you can download. And it's a very simple template that is for an advanced healthcare directive. It also has explanatory notes to tell you what it is you need to think about or not think about. As both of us have said, you could start off with just one thing. I don't want to be resuscitated if my chances are so poor. It could be that or it could be I don't want to be resuscitated and I'm going to appoint Susie as my designated healthcare representative to make sure that that one decision that I've made gets followed through if something happens to me. It could be that or it could be going back to our cancer example that it could be very specific and very detailed because I have the experience I know from before. But I think just reinforcing the point that Susie had made, our palliative care colleagues were very supportive of advanced healthcare directors and do a lot of you know, discussions with people about what might happen. So it is really important to go back and chat to your GP and to talk to the specialist people that you're with, because that's what they're trained to do is to have conversations and conversations about things that they don't know, you know, in terms of where where things might go. So if I've got this, if I've gone to the Irish Hospice Foundation, if I've gone to Safeguard and I've looked around this and I've reflected on these areas, am I filling in a template? And I've printed the template off and I'm just I've talked about it and I'm just putting it down on paper and this is my document. That's it. Well, there's a couple of formalities that you have to do. You have to have it witnessed and then it Mm. specifies who those witnesses are. Once you have it witnessed and again, it it sets out who exactly the witnesses need to be and that there's no coercion or undue influence. It doesn't need to be a solicitor. What's really important is if you have identified somebody as your healthcare representative that you've asked them and that they know that they're your representative because there's no point them not knowing about it. The second thing then is that they must have a copy of it. They need to know what's in it. The same with the will. Like, you know, you'll you'll identify people in your will that are going to, you know, your executive and maybe trustees. The first thing you're going to do is share it with the executor and the trustees. So the same with this. The difference with this is this is a living will. So you need to have it in a place it can be found because if it can't be found, then a healthcare professional can't honour it if they can't see it and they do need to see it. They can't go on hearsay. One of my friends has emailed a copy of it to her friends so that they have it in their email should it be needed, which I thought was a really practical thing to do. But other people have given a copy to their GP and also then to have it placed on their hospital file. All right. So, so they're very practical things. Yeah, because you know, I was thinking that like if something happens, it was at the back of the press, where is this thing I thought of last year or two years ago? Where did the document go? It goes back to the conversations, people that are close to you or or people that are going to be in that circle. This is what I want. Please help me support these wishes. And this is where my plan is. Should you need access for your health care? It's funny, sometimes we're not great at making wills in Ireland. We're not great at thinking about death. I don't think anybody's great about thinking about death. But death, you know, in terms of a health and well-being podcast, we're here talking about, you know, promotion and prevention all the time. But we don't often try and look down the trail that far. You know, I, I think for myself, I'm based in a hospital now and I pass the mortuary when I'm going over to the canteen. And it kind of grounds you that life is about death as well. And death is part of it as healthcare. And, and sometimes we don't highlight that in healthcare at all. So it's interesting that you're trying to engage. You have a prevention message to take some of the challenges out of that end of life or palliative care process. I think it's very important. I spend a lot of time helping people to have good lives. Yeah. But I'm also very passionate about people having a good death. Yeah. And one which they've had some part in planning and directing as to what they want to happen in their life. Now, advanced health care directors are not necessarily about dying, right? Yeah. They can yeah. also yeah. be, can we just say, you can put in what you do want to happen yeah. Yeah. as well, you know, and that if it's clinically recommended and have benefited that it would be followed, you know, but as well as the things that you don't want to happen. But I think it's really important that, you know, people do have agency in all aspects of their lives. And that means when their lives are ending also. That's the fundamental, isn't it? Presume capacity for as long as possible. And if you don't have capacity, you've done something 
to help yourself and help your loved ones, help your healthcare provide that support to your capacity, isn't it? Yeah. And also going back to the point that Susie made about it's a living will. There's parts that might be about at the end of life, but it's also about what I want to happen when I can't make decisions for myself. And and maybe I'm the type of person that wants to keep on going yeah. until the bitter end. And I want interventions because we do know that interventions aren't given to people with disabilities, aren't given to older persons. The decisions are made, you know, because, well, maybe they didn't want them, but make sure that's known that actually I'm the kind of person that wants to keep going until the battery runs out. And I think that's the kind of message that we're keen to support. One of the things that happened in COVID, which was dreadful, which happened in, in England, whereas a decision was made now, which was reversed because of advocacy and lobbying, etc. But a decision was made that it was about the ventilators, you know, limited ventilators. So a decision was made that people of a certain age, people with certain kinds of disabilities, with certain kinds of respiratory conditions would not be ventilated. So obviously that had huge implications here. We immediately changed our do not attempt resuscitation policy that said absolutely no way that does not apply in this country that we're not going to use age as a basis for not giving somebody a ventilator or disability or or anything like that. And I think that's really important here that if it's really important for you to stay going as long as you can, make that known. Or if it's really important to you to not stay going as long as you can, make that known, it, you know, like make your wishes known, whatever those wishes are. Like it's not about trying to intervene on people's wishes, but just make them known. One of the points that you mentioned before we sat down today was about your place, where you're going to be getting your care from. What kind of considerations do people need to think about? Do you have a discussion about where and who's going to be providing the care? Is that good to be part of this? I suppose if it's one of the things where you don't want to be in a long term care facility where you don't know what's going on right. and that you can't have a quality of life, you want to put that you know, into an advanced healthcare directive, then it's important that those wishes are known so that if clinicians felt that they could intervene to keep you alive, but you don't want to be kept alive in a, in a situation where you're artificially supported through nutrition or medication and you're not able to have conversations or be aware of what's happening around you. I suppose in that way, I don't think that people can say, no, I don't want to go into long-term care in an advanced healthcare directive, but they can talk about the interventions that might be an option for you that you don't want to be followed. Or another aspect of it as well is that you have the conversation. I mean, people are having conversations like this now. We've exhausted everything, like most people, not not everyone. There are people that are choosing to live in shared care, shared accommodation because they don't, you know, they're on their own. There's lots of really amazing models across Europe, actually, where there's shared care, particularly people that are now alone, like in their 80s or 90s who want to live and people with disabilities as well who want to live in shared care where it's independent, but people will come in and check and stuff. So obviously it's limited in Ireland Like we don't have enough of that at all. But, you know, we need to move to that kind of model. Having the conversation, if we have honoured your wish as far as we can, but it comes to a point, what would you want? That's a very hard question to ask anybody, but it's still a really important conversation to have and then have that recorded. Like an advanced healthcare directive isn't for that, but it is about recording what your loved one or, you know, the person that you've supported, what they said they wanted at that point in time. When is the best time to make an advanced healthcare directive in one's life? When you're well. When you're well. I think it's probably to start off now, you know, and it's also not something that can be done immediately. I think it is a process that people yeah. go through because it's good to talk to people about it, to people that are close to in your life and to your medical professionals about it and then come to a decision. But it's also something that is, as we said, is living so it can be changed and you can change your mind. You can add to it. But it is important. I think it's important that people do it when they don't need it. Yeah, I think it's probably the best thing to say to people that start having the conversation, start thinking about it, exploring and reading the information that's there so that you can think about what you want and what you don't want. And so that you have your thoughts set out and people are aware of them and tell people about it when you've done it so that they know about it. The other thing as well is that our legislation is written in a way that you can make it at the very last minute. As well, because again, another example, I live in a county where we've lots of car accidents. So car accidents are always at the forefront of my mind where you've been in a really serious car accident. You're still conscious, but it's not OK. So you can make an advanced healthcare directive there and then and you can say it to the emergency services there and then and you can write it down or you can tell them, look, please record this. If by the time I get to hospital, things are looking really bad, I'm not going to make a full recovery 
I don't want to be resuscitated or I don't want to be machines. Our brilliant policymakers put that in place so that you could do it at the last minute. Or, for example, another one would be you've written something. I don't want any intervention. Your condition is coming to the point where it's actually getting quite terrifying for you and you want every intervention so you can change your mind. And you can say, actually, do whatever is going to make me comfortable. Give me whatever, because I'm actually not able to cope with this right now. I'm not able to cope with the pain. I'm not able to cope with the panic or whatever it is. So it allows for that. You know, it's dynamic. There is a point at which, though, when you can't change them, when you lack capacity, they're a living will when you have the capacity to make them. But as we know, we presume, we support, we, you know, we support a person as much as possible to be able to make decisions that we don't try and stop them. Okay. just before we wrap this up. I want to ask you about getting this information out even within the health service, health service staff and within the HSE itself and within the broader family seem to be very important stakeholders in this work that needs to progress. So can you tell me about how you're getting that message out to health service people? So we've been doing a number of webinars on this. We're planning on more webinars. As I said earlier on, the Safeguarding Ireland have just done a campaign. We will also be doing a campaign because obviously this is a culture change. Yeah. So we'll be doing campaigns over and over. And again, we'll be focusing on different groups. So we'll probably focus on staff next in terms of what you need to know. The decision support service are also going to be doing a campaign on planning ahead. And as we said earlier, there's different elements of planning ahead, but we're looking at advanced healthcare directives today. And then we're always looking for opportunities to work with. So obviously the ICGP, the Irish College of General Practitioners are really important because that's the first place that people go to. They play a pivotal role. And there's trust there with the GP. So Huge having amount. that conversation with yeah. the GP is a key Huge. And the ICGB have done a lot of work over the years on trying to start that conversation. There's a number of GP practices that have specialized in having right. the conversation. Yeah, yeah, right, yeah. Very good, very good. OK, well, I'm delighted that we can support the journey in some way as part of the podcast. And I'd like to thank you both for coming in today, Susie and Kriva. Thanks so much for sharing so eloquently and sensitively this information. I think it's very important that people go to the signposted places there, like safeguardingireland.org, the Decision Support Service and the Irish Hospice Foundation. To all our listeners, thank you for your continued support and please share this episode with anyone that you think would benefit from it. And if you'd like to know more information about HSE Health and Wellbeing, follow us on X and take a look at our YouTube channel or register for our e-zine by emailing healthandwellbeing.communications at hse.ie. So once again, I'd like to thank Creva Gleeson and Susie Byrne for joining me today to talk about this very important subject. And thank you for listening to another episode of the HSE Talking Health and Wellbeing podcast.